Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Sarah. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I expect, um, sounds like most of you may have already read the book, so I'm going to give you a little bit of insight into how I wrote it. I'm really looking forward to talking about, um, talking with you, um, with your questions. But for those of you who may not have read the book, I want to start by telling you about someone who changed my life, who I met in March of 2011. Now, if she stood up, she would have only stood about four feet tall. She weighed only 40 pounds. And she had venom like a snake, a beak like a parrot, and could pour her baggy, boneless body through a tiny opening. She could taste with her skin because she was a giant Pacific octopus. Well, I met her on a cold day in March at the New England Aquarium. I went behind the scenes and I asked the Aquarius if I might actually touch her. So he lifted up the lid to the tank. And as you can imagine, you need a lid on your octopus tank because octopuses love to get out. And when that happens, you and the octopus have a big problem. He lifted up the heavy lid and immediately she slid over to greet us. I saw her eyes look for my face, lock onto my face, looking right into my eyes. She turned bright red with excitement. And the next thing I knew, her arms were reaching up out of the water, boiling up out of the water to meet mine. So I plunged my hands and arms into the cold 47 degree salt water and instantly my hands and arms were covered with dozens and dozens of her soft questing suckers. And she was both feeling me and tasting me at the same time. Now later I realized that not everyone would like this. There's all kinds of bad PR out there about octopuses, depicting them as horrible monsters that tear you apart and how the blood will spurt from your skin when they dismember you. But this wasn't what I felt at all. Now admittedly, had a person begun tasting me so early in our relationship, I would have found this alarming. But because it was a giant Pacific octopus, I was absolutely thrilled because I had never before known anyone like Athena. Athena was named after the Greek goddess of war and wisdom, and she was a feisty octopus. And I later learned that no other visitor had been greeted like this. No other visitor, for example, had she allowed to touch her head. But she let me touch her head she let me pet her all over. And soon I saw that she had turned white beneath my touch. And white is the color of a relaxed octopus. I was thrilled at this encounter because I could see that this animal, who was so far distant from a human that you'd almost need to go to outer space or to science fiction, to imagine someone so different from us, this animal had recognized me and recognized me as an individual and treated me differently from other individual humans that she had met. And I realized that what was happening here was I was having a meeting of the minds with a mollusk. Now, mollusks, as you probably know, are not renowned for their intelligence. They include animals like mussels and clams and snails. Now, clams don't even have a brain. But octopuses, it was said, are very smart. And this is why I wanted to do this book. I had written, as you learned from Sarah's introduction, about all kinds of critters before, snakes and dolphins and, and apes and, and tigers tree kangaroos, um, even tarantulas. But never before 
had I done any research on a marine invertebrate. And most of our Earth is covered by sea. In fact, besides the 70% of the Earth's surface that's covered by sea, 90% of the Earth's habitable space is inhabited by invertebrate animals in the sea. So even though I called myself a naturalist, I really did not know the dominant life form on our Earth. Most animals on our planet are marine invertebrates like Athena. And so I desperately wanted to get to know one. And that's what I got to do with this book. Now, one very tragic fact about octopuses is that they don't live very long, only three to five years. And by the time you meet a giant Pacific octopus, that animal is already several years old. I visited Athena again and again, but after our third visit, to my deep sorrow, I learned she had died. And I thought, oh my gosh, my research is going to come to an end. But then I got an email from the aquarist who had opened that tank to me saying, we're getting another octopus soon. And if you want to come in and shake hands times eight, you're welcome to come. So my octopus odyssey had begun. And these animals are so different from us, it amazed me that Athena could even find my face. Our bodies go head, body, limbs. Their bodies go body, head, limbs. This part of the octopus is not the head. Most people think it is. It's not. This is like our torso. This part, called the mantle, is where organs of uh, respiration, digestion, and reproduction are located. And the head is just this little part right here. And then here's their arms. Well, where's their mouth? Conveniently located in the armpits. Thank you very much. Their senses are so different from ours. I mean, the fact that I could reach across this huge divide separating humans and mollusks was amazing. Think of it. You know, they learn about the world largely through suckers which, alas, we don't possess, but they're extremely important um, organs for the animal. They can lift 30 pounds with a single three-inch diameter sucker. So when I met Athena that day, I was meeting somebody who could exert tons of force, tons of force, one single sucker lifting 30 pounds. They can hold their whole body up. Her body was about 40 pounds with two suckers. And as it turns out, you can often see them doing this. They have these superpowers that we can only dream of, one of which is that they can change both color and shape. They can go from this to this to this to this in less than a second. So they're very hard to study in the wild. One reason why is you can't tell if the octopus you're looking at is the same octopus you just met or a different one. Because you can't remember, like, oh, it's the purple one. Oh, wait, it's the one with the stripes. You can't even remember, oh, this one was really big because they can change size. You can't remember, like, oh, this is the one that was covered with all these little bumps, which are called papillations. But I had a wonderful opportunity at the New England Aquarium to get to know these individuals. And this book was the chronicle of my relationship, getting to know these wonderful creatures. Well, the next animal that I was to, to get to know was named Octavia. And at first, Octavia wanted nothing to do with any of us. She'd been caught in the wild. And most of the, the aquarium octopuses, typically, they're caught in the wild. They, there's only been one giant Pacific octopus ever raised successfully in captivity from an egg, one. And they lay 100,000 eggs. That was at the Seattle Aquarium. So they are caught in the wild. They are not endangered. Um, and we can talk later about you know, the ethics of capturing a wild animal for display in captivity. But um, typically, they come and they live in a, a small barrel behind the scenes where they get to know people before they go on display. But because Athena had died suddenly and no one had any idea she was about to die, Bill 
the Aquarius had to quickly find a pretty big octopus and put her right on display. And this animal wanted nothing to do with us. We tried to interest her in feeding from our hands. We tried offering her a fish on a stick. She didn't want to come near. She didn't want to come near. She didn't want to come near. Until one day I went and offered her a fish on a stick. She grabbed the stick, and then she grabbed me. And that was very exciting. I soon found myself bent over like a half-open book being pulled into the tank. And this had actually happened to me before. I wasn't at all afraid. I didn't feel like I was under attack. I felt like I was under investigation. You can feel the intelligence of these creatures when you're with them. If you've stood in front of a tank with an octopus who is active, and you look into their face, I'm not the first one who has felt that there's someone looking back at me. But scientists have actually done a number of studies on these animals showing just how smart they are. They do recognize individuals. They've done studies showing that even when individual humans are dressed identically, the octopuses will recognize them just by looking at their face. And this astonishes me because look how different our faces are. I mean, Look at the weird place my mouth is. It's not in my armpits at all. It's right there near my eyes. That must have been terribly disturbing the first time an octopus figured that out. But nonetheless, they know where our faces are, and they know that our faces are the way that you decide who's who. Other animals know this too, by the way, including chickens. They recognize each other by looking at their faces, and they recognize us by looking at our faces. And if you mess with the face, like if you put a a funny extra comb on a chicken, um, they, they won't recognize each other. If you put a weird hat on, a lot of times the birds also are upset. But back to octopuses, these guys are so smart that they love to play with the same toys our children play with. And now it's being recognized in zoos and aquariums that to keep your octopus occupied, you've got to give them toys. So they give them things like Legos. They give them things like Mr. Potato Head. And they take apart Mr. Potato Head, and sometimes they put him back together. They have them play in these like habitrail constructions that are made for um, you know, little gerbils to run through. And they will pour their bodies through there, but they'll also unscrew them and reorganize them. They'll take things apart, they'll put them back together. And to amuse the octopuses at New England Aquarium, we actually had uh, Wilson Menashe, a, a designer and um, engineer who had many patents to his name, come up with a toy to amuse the octopuses. And it was this series of interlocking plastic, clear plastic boxes. And what you would do is lock the box with a crab or something tasty inside and the octopus would figure out how to unlock it. Then you'd take that box and put it in another box with a different lock. The octopus would unlock that box and the box inside it. And then there was a third box, and it had two different locks. So the octopus would unlock four different locks to get to the tasty crab. And what is so cool is that the octopuses themselves are so individual, their personalities are so unique, that each octopus had a different approach to this. One of the octopuses I never met, Guinevere, who was Bill Murphy's first octopus, she was impetuous. And one day, she got in such a hurry to get to the crab that she knew how to unlock the boxes, but didn't feel like it. Instead, she just crushed it. Well, it made a big crack, and after she died, when they tried to amuse another octopus with the boxes, one day, Truman, who had learned how to unlock the boxes, got a special treat from Bill, and it was that he put two crabs inside the box. Well, Truman normally was a laid-back kind of guy, but seeing the two crabs in there, and the two crabs, of course, started fighting because they're crabby, and that made the octopus even more excited, Truman, seeing the opportunity to grab two fighting crabs, didn't bother with the lock. He went through the crack 
put his whole body through the crack that Guinevere had made, and then you saw, wait a minute, what has happened? Ah, this. <laughs> that is Truman in the box. And the funny thing is, he's in the box in the space between this box and the box inside it. Well, he was very upset at that point because even he couldn't get his arms around to open the inner box. And finally, Bill came to the rescue. So when you get to meet someone like this, you have to recognize their and honor their individuality. Often, their name is a, a hint of who you're about to meet. Because in aquaria, public aquaria, often all the fish aren't named. But if you go behind the scenes, you will find that they have named the octopus, even if it's not for the public to know. And their names often reflect who they are. At the, the uh, Seattle Aquarium, there was one named Emily Dickinson, because she was so shy, she never came out from behind the filter. There was another one called Leisure Suit Larry, because his arms were always all over you. And Athena had really earned her name. Now, Octavia was named by a little girl who just suggested the name. But she was actually a lovely, lovely lady once I got to know her. So how do you get to know an octopus? Well, one good way is to offer a delicious fish. And once I had offered that fish and then offered my arms and my flesh for her to taste and explore, then she was up for being my friend. I was amazed at how quickly the transformation took place. And it was good because the next week I was coming back with some folks from Living on Earth Radio. And I had no idea how Octavia was going to behave. What, what if she was going to be standoffish? Well, she wasn't. Right away, she let everyone pet her and feed her. And everyone was just having a blast getting to know this wonderful octopus. We had a whole bucket of fish that we were handing her a fish every once in a while and petting her. There were, gosh, I think there was six of us petting her at once and watching her. But just to show you how smart these animals are, not only can they unlock locks and take apart Legos, they can art outsmart people pretty easily. Because at one point we thought, you know, it would be fun to feed her another fish. Where's the bucket? And we looked down, the bucket was gone. She had reached up, and without any of us seeing it, she stole the bucket of fish and was holding onto it, not even eating the fish. She was playing with the bucket. So play is one of those attributes of higher minds, or at least it is so considered. And octopuses love to play. And they don't just play with their suckers. They also play with their jet or funnel, which you can see right here. They use the funnel for various different things, including jetting through the sea when they're in a big hurry. But they can also use it almost like a leaf blower when they want to clear detritus in front of their den, for example. They like to keep the fronts of their dens very neat. They can also use it to play with objects and play with people. One of the researchers who I got to know, Roland Anderson, documented an octopus using her jet, several of them actually did this, used their jet to shoot a ball into the stream of water being circulated by the filter in her tank. So effectively, she was bouncing the ball against the wall so it would come back to her, just like you would play with a basketball. And this was a huge thing to find a marine invertebrate inventing a game. This was an astonishing, astonishing find. And I also got to see how these octopuses use their funnels, sometimes to social ends. There was a, a lovely man who I met who was the twin of one of the people who volunteered at the aquarium. This guy, his name was Danny, and um, he had a condition called pervasive developmental disorder. So um, it's, it's what his, his, his thinking was very different from ours. And uh, Danny was a great guy, and he loved octopuses. 
So his twin surprised him by meeting an octopus behind the scenes. And this actually was Kali, another octopus in the book. And Danny was scared, though, because he had read stuff about octopuses that eat people and buildings, and he was shaking when he touched her. Well, Kali was interacting with all of us just fine, letting us pet her and suck it on our skin and looking at us. But every time Danny would try to touch her, he was shaking, he was frightened. And I am convinced that she could tell. So what she did, she squirted him right in the face. And he laughed, he thought that was hilarious, and right after that, he was happy to play with, with Kali, and um, completely unafraid. And he made a drawing that I keep on my desk of that day. So I got to know Octavia pretty well, I think. I got to know Kali pretty well. I got to know who was playful, who liked what, um, this is one of the gestures an octopus will sometimes do, like a puppy rolling on its back when they want to be fed. Now, you would think the best thing to do when you're feeding an octopus would be to stick the fish right in their mouth, which, as you know, is right here. But no, they don't like that. They would rather you hand it to one of the, one of the suckers, and they will pass it from sucker to sucker to sucker to sucker toward the mouth on a conveyor belt. Now, why do they do this? For the same reason you don't take an ice cream and jam it down your throat. They can taste with all of their skin, but particularly their suckers. They're enjoying the taste of that fish. And they enjoy the sensation of tasting us. And I believe that they can sometimes taste our emotions because our emotions are accompanied by our neurotransmitters that are in our blood, and I think they can taste our blood through our skin and possibly our bone as well. Because they have powers that we don't. The octopus brain is so different from a human brain that it's amazing that scientists could even find the thing. Our brain looks like a walnut in its shell. Their brain is a ring that wraps around their throat and three-fifths of their neurons aren't even in their brain, but in their arms. So the severed arm of an octopus can go off and do stuff. Now, many people have asked me, well, can you compare how smart an octopus is to, say, you know, a two-year-old child? And my answer is always no. Because what if an octopus were trying to assess our intelligence? They might well ask, how many colors can your severed arm turn in one second? And when we say no, nothing, none, they could conclude we were really stupid. They just have a whole other way of experiencing the truth of this earth. But what astonishes me most is the similarities and the way we can meet. And this became very evident to me when Octavia laid her eggs. Now, here's the eggs. A lot of people who came to the aquarium couldn't recognize that these things, these pearly chains, were thousands and tens of thousands and perhaps 100,000 eggs. Now, once you lay eggs, if you're an octopus in the wild, you stay in your lair and you never leave again. You never go out to eat. You never go out to hunt. You can never leave those precious eggs. You have to protect them. You have to clean them. You have to squirt at them with your funnel. You'll be fluffing them with your arms. You've got to keep detritus from settling on the precious eggs, and you must guard them against everything. The eggs occupied all of Octavia's psyche. And although we could hand her food on a grabber, we felt, you know, we're just never going to see her and touch her again. She wouldn't come to the surface to look at us in the face. Well, she was such an incredible mother that even though her eggs were infertile, she stayed on those eggs month after month after month. Normally in the wild, had her eggs been fertile, they would have hatched after about six months. But six months went by, and the eggs didn't hatch, and she did not die. She hung on and on six months, seven months, eight months, nine months. 
she was still alive. Normally, you die after you lay your eggs in your, and your babies hatch. Hers did not hatch. But one day, I came in and saw she had a horribly swollen eye. And just like with people, your body just starts to break down when you're at the end of your normal lifespan. And this was what was happening to her. She had an infection. And Bill felt, her keeper felt, that she should be taken behind the scenes where she wouldn't have people passing by looking at her. She wouldn't have light flooding her eyes. Normally, she would have been beneath the sea in darkness in a quiet place where she would have no stimulation at all. But now he had to move this strong octopus off her eggs to a different part of the aquarium. How was he going to do that? Well, he sent his assistant in and tried to pick her up and put her in a bucket so he could move her. And his assistant, Darshan, said, man, I can't believe how strong she is. She is not moving. I cannot dislodge this octopus from her lair. So Bill said, let me try. Now remember, Bill hadn't touched her or looked at her because she was in her lair. He could not look at her except from the other side of the glass for nine months. She hadn't tasted him. She hadn't seen him. And remember, octopuses of this kind, of the 250 kinds, but the giant Pacific octopus only lives three to five years. She hadn't seen him in nine months, which is the equivalent of something like 25 years. The minute he touched her, she recognized who he was. She recognized his taste, let go, and let him put her in the bucket and transfer her behind the scenes. And when I came in a few days later with Wilson Menashe, the guy who's the octopus enrichment expert who built those cool cubes for them to play with, I was absolutely astonished. She recognized me too. She rose to the top of the barrel and she let me stroke her and looked into my face. Now there's people who would say, this is just anthropomorphism. You're just projecting onto animals the things that you feel. Well, there's another word that's gaining purchase in our language, which speaks of the opposite of anthropomorphism, and that's called anthropodenial. And that is saying, hey, to say that animals have no emotions is crazy. It's like denying the fact of evolution. Of course they have emotions. Anyone who has a dog or a cat or a hamster, anyone who's watched their own fish knows they have emotions. And we know it also from looking at the neurotransmitters that we can find in their blood, neurotransmitters that accompany our most sacred emotional states, including, including oxytocin which is a hormone that bonds people together. Oxytocin levels peak when we give birth to our infants. They peak when we are around the people who we love, our mates, our children, our parents. Octopuses have a hormone so like oxytocin, it's called cephalotocin for cephalopods. And in 2012, some of the top neuroscientists in the world all gathered in Cambridge, England to sign something called the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness. And what that declaration was, was saying that all mammals and all birds and certainly some invertebrates, including octopuses, have what is called the neural substrate to generate consciousness. This was why I wrote this book. It was to honor the connection that we have with the rest of animate creation. I'm reading a book right now that's, uh, it was written, it was, came out in 2013 or 20, 2012 by a Native American botanist. And she's talking about the native way as well as the scientific way of looking at the plant world and in it, she invites her students who love the natural world, who love the earth and the sea and the animals, to imagine, what if they loved you back? 
wouldn't your commitment to preserving them, to respecting them, to celebrate them, wouldn't your commitment deepen with a reciprocal relationship? Well, this is what I got to know by meeting and loving these octopuses. What their love felt like to them may be quite different from what love feels like to me, but I know it was meaningful. And what they showed me was that this world is so much more connected and alive and even holy than I ever imagined before. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm Molly. I'm a student at Glen Ellen High School. Um, I've recently been looking into a marine biology major at the Virginia Wesleyan College in Virginia Beach. And I just want to know, how do you go about asking someone if you can meet their octopus? Ah, well, good, really good question. With, with me, um, what I did was I got an assignment um, from Orion Magazine, which kind of gave me an in. I then called the PR people and I said, hey, I have an assignment. I pitched the idea to the magazine. I said, I, I have this uh, story I'd, I'd like to write about octopus and I'll be featuring your octopus and therefore I'm giving kind of something back to you. So that was how I got my foot in the door. And I, I, I was so smitten with the animal. The people were so kind. They could see there was a connection there that they invited me back again and again and again. So what I like to try to do is have a specific project in mind. Um, what I would recommend is that you tell them that you, you want to be a marine biologist. Um, or tell them maybe you want to do a, a report and you're researching your report and you would like to spend some, some time watching the animal for, for you, you kind of just can't say, hey, I, I, wanna, I, I wanna grope your octopus. <laughs> um, but if you, if you have a, a, a thing that you're going to be doing with your interaction, that will be a big help, Molly. And I think, too, it would be great if, um, if you spent some time watching the octopus first and then asked to go behind the scenes, because then you would already have had some time invested in either their octopus or an octopus elsewhere. Um, and you can, you know, then they'll already be impressed. Like, gosh, you know, I, I spent eight hours on Wednesday and I noticed that this, this, this. And make sure that you send them the report when it's done and, and keep that connection with them. Make them feel part of your work. And I feel like you would totally be welcomed I would welcome you in a minute. In fact, Molly, if you come to New England Aquarium sometime, you just give me a shout, email me. If you Google me, you'll go right to my, my webpage, and um, I'll see if I can get you behind the scenes. Awesome. Um, and one more question. Now that you've uh, kind of explored uh, the consciousness of an octopus, are you interested in exploring other encephalopods or marine animals? Yeah, I now am scuba certified which I'm kind of spastic at it, but I'm, I, and gosh, I was the oldest person in my class, and I, I kept shooting to the top, and my regulator kept leaking, and I, but gosh, yeah, um, I did a book after this one on great white sharks, and I got to go in a shark cage, and uh, get really up close and personal with great whites, and um, I use my scuba skills, as you know from the book, to meet octopuses and two different countries, and um, I just pitched a, uh, another book in the Scientists in the Field series on giant manta rays in Peru, so I'm hoping to be diving with them. So, and they're supposed to be very smart animals, too. So, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to do more and more of this stuff. <laughs> well, thank you so much for uh, giving your time to us today. Oh, thank you, Molly. <laughs> my, uh, my name is Bashar, and uh, were you scared every time an octopus was like touching or feeling you, like something like, like you said? No, I was never scared of them. Never. Um, you know what scares me is a cocktail party. Um, <laughs> no, I, I never. I, I was never. I was never scared of them. Um, if I had, you know, an octopus's mouth really close to my skin, it it would um, it would worry me. But because they have such long arms, 
um, you can be pretty far away from their mouth. And I don't, you know, I think you can feel when someone's going to bite you. You kind of get that feeling if no they're one, angry. No one has ever done that to me, though. What's that? No one has ever tried to bite me. No, no, no one's ever tried to bite me. <laughs> what? All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Let's try this one again. <laughs> um, so, if animals experience consciousness, how is that different from our own consciousness? Is our consciousness even different? That's a really good question. And I don't know how their consciousness might feel to them. Because, I mean, frankly, I don't know what my consciousness, you know, what my husband's consciousness feels like to him. Um, I don't know what your consciousness feels like to you. Um, I, I do feel like if we have consciousness, and there are philosophers who say we don't, because you can't like find it, but if we have consciousness, I think just about everybody else has it. In fact, I mean, there's some really interesting evidence that even things like trees might have it. There's a neat book out that was translated from the German and just came out, gosh, last year, I guess it was, yeah, it was 2016, called The Hidden Life of Trees. And there is a thing that they call, that scientists are calling the wood wide web. It's all these mycelia, they're like the hyphae of, um, of uh, fungi that connect the roots of trees and allow trees to communicate with each other. And we know that they communicate with each other. It's not like, oh, I think they're communicating with each other because one tree will send out a chemical to warn another tree that you know, insects are coming. So there may be consciousness in things that we thought there was absolutely no evidence for. And um, you know the sunflower sea star? Let me see if I can find it. Oh, you know what? You can see the sunflower sea star right here. Here's the sunflower sea star. Okay. He, he's dead now, he, but he was a great guy, and he had no brain. But even though they have no brain, the animal recognized us and would come up and ask for food. So even looking for and finding no brain, there seems to be what we would call consciousness. So sorry I can't answer your great question, but maybe you will. Hi. Um my name is Asiya, and I'm from Hamarco High School. And I actually had a couple questions, but the um, first one was, um, I think it's pretty amazing how you wrote this book and how like everything flowed like so easily, especially like with the dialect. Did you write this while you were experiencing these, or oh, what afterwards? a good question. Are you a writer? No, but um, I write a little bit. No. Well, it's, that's a real writerly question. Um, what I would do is. Um, the minute I'd get my hands out of the water, they were often frozen and I couldn't get them to work, but the minute they would work, I would take notes on what I had experienced. I would also take notes as I walked around the aquarium about what people were saying and I, I did interviews and this, that, and the other thing. Then I would come home and uh, that night and the following morning, I would essentially try to write as if in a journal, a, an essay about what that day kind of meant to me. And that's what I do in the field all the time for all of my books. And it's the last thing in the world you want to do because you're tired, you know. Sometimes you've been, you know, hiking all day or riding a camel or, you know, you're tired from scuba diving, but you've got to do it. And so that, um, that kind of captures the immediacy. But when you sit down to write, what I do is I wait until all the research is done. I've done all the field work, I've done all the interviews, I've, I've read all the books about octopuses and all that kind of stuff. And then I sit down with a scary blank screen. And I often refer back to that journal uh, to write it. I, I try to connect the reader with the immediacy of what I felt, the same way that, you know, if you've just had this fantastic thing happen and you just can't wait to tell your best friend about it, you know, oh my gosh, this great thing happened today. And then you set out the scene. And you want the reader to be right there beside you while you were experiencing it. And that's, that's what I 
That's what I try to do, and I often reach back through time into my journal to do that. Who was the last thing you did with um, the octopus before she died? Uh, the last thing she, she did, boy, I see, because she was in a, a barrel where she could be very quiet um, and wasn't getting any light, no one knows, but she probably just was sitting there quietly like a person dying in their sleep. Um, we don't know if she was awake or not. But we do know that she was peaceful. I mean, um, what was your, what did you do like, like uh, what, before she died? What, was the what did I do? Oh, yeah. when, when I met, I petted her. I petted her. I offered her fish, which she dropped. Um, I stroked her. Um, I wept. And interestingly, you know, in our tears, we excrete some of those neurochemicals that I was talking about earlier. And she may have been able, when my tears fell into the water, she may have been able to taste my emotion even more strongly. But I, I, don't, I don't know. But I just felt so privileged to know this individual and to know that she recognized me and cared about me enough to even when she was sick and old and tired, to make that effort to, to rise to the top and greet me, that just was so meaningful. And it will stay with me till the day I die. And, and I hope that when I'm old and sick and dying, that I can make someone feel as blessed and lucky as she made me feel. I'm Caroline. Do you have like a favorite animal that you studied? Wow. Well, I have a favorite animal at home, and he's my puppy. <laughs> his, his name is Thurber. He's a Border Collie. He's going to be two on June 14. But, you know, usually the animal that you're looking at right at that moment is your favorite. And right now, um, I, just finished a, I just finished a memoir for young adults about all the animals that have helped me as teach me how to be a good creature as I've grown up. Um, and I realize I have so many animals to thank. Now, the next book that I will be writing will be on wildebeest. And I experienced the wildebeest migration with the top expert on wildebeest, a friend of mine I've known for 30 years, last summer. And I'm going to be sitting down to write that. So you know what it is? When, when you have a new creature to write about, to learn about, you just open your heart wide and empty out your whole soul. And then, like water rushing inside a jar, that animal's glory and surprise and mystery just fills you up. And that's who you're filled up with at the time. So I, I, don't, I don't have a favorite until the next animal I write about. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Wyatt. How long did it take you to write The Soul of an Octopus? How long was I writing it? Well, I guess it started on that day in March of 2011. So I continued to do the research for it until about 2014 um, and wrote it up during about a nine month period that I was actively sitting at my desk writing every day. It came out in May of 2015. Um, so there's a lag time between the moment you finish your draft and it comes out, and that lag time's a, a while. But it took a long, it took a, a long time. But I, I loved it. I had so much fun writing it. When I would come home from the aquarium, I would be singing in the car. I was so happy. And I loved writing it as well as researching it. My name's Rod. How did you become an author? How did I become an author? Good question. Are you also a writer? No. Thinking of it? Or just wondering? Just wondering. Well, I got to say, I mean, I would encourage you to do it because I am just having a blast. I cannot believe the life I'm having. OK, well, um, I, went to, I went to college, and I knew that I wanted to do exactly what I'm doing. So I, I actually triple majored, but you don't have to. I took magazine journalism. Um, 
I took a lot of biology. I took a lot of courses about everything. But I, I worked on a newspaper for five years and uh, covered science. Then I had an opportunity to go to Australia on a vacation. And I joined this organization called Earthwatch. And some of you guys should look this up, earthwatch.org. They pair paying laymen with scientists around the world and you go on these like two week expeditions with scientists and to help them. So I did that and loved it so much that I came back and quit my job and moved to a tent in the outback and lived for six months and studied emus. And during that time I realized, you know what, I loved, I loved working in a newspaper, but I think I want to work for myself and I'm going to write books. And so I did. So I just kind of decided to do it. Um, to get your book published, there's different ways of doing it. You can write your book and then try to send it in to publishers or agents, or you can develop a proposal and send that to a literary agent or a publisher and say, I'd like to do this book. Can you give me some money to try to, to do it? Um, but the first time I, I wrote the book, I think my editors freaked out because I started writing it not from the beginning to the end. I wrote it from the end to the beginning. I think he thought I was dropped on my head as a child or something. But it worked. There's so many right ways to do it. And the reason I tell you the, the weird way I did my first book, I don't always do that. But to just remind you that there are so many right ways to do anything. And if you want to write a book, you will, you will find a way that works. And there's lots of books, too, that have advice on how to get your book published and things like that. But I wanted to write books because I, I loved writing for newspapers, and I still write for newspapers. But at the end of the day, your story's on the bottom of a birdcage. But you know, if you're writing a book, someone's going to spend many hours with you. And that book can really change people's lives and create a personal connection in a way that sometimes an article doesn't. So I have a blast. Anyway, if you want to be a writer, you will find a way to make it work. <laughs> I'm Reed, and I'm from Tuckahoe. Uh, I was just wondering, have you ever encountered an octopus in the ocean? Oh, yes. In fact, I purposely um, learned scuba just so I could meet wild octopuses. And um, I met them in Mexico on a dive in Cozumel. And then I also went to Morea in French Polynesia, and I wrote an entire separate book for younger readers called The Octopus Scientist, just about that expedition. I went with a, a whole bunch of cool researchers who were top researchers in you know, octopuses around the world, and we studied them in Morea. OK, thank and you. And your library might have that book. It's called The Octopus Scientist. OK, thank you. Thank you. I'm Louise from Raw. Uh, what made you get into animals and write books about them in the first place? Oh, good question. Well, you know, I mean, I always loved animals. I loved animals before I could talk, before I could. I, I wandered into the hippo exhibit at the Frankfurt Zoo before I was two years old, because I wanted to be with the hippos. I always felt animals were my mentors, my inspiration, my best friends. I was an only child, but when I was three, we got a Scottish Terrier named Molly, who essentially became my older sister, even though she was technically younger than me. Because as you know, dogs attain adulthood at like, by five, they're an adult. By five, we're not. We're still babies by then. So um, I, always felt, I always felt like these were my best friends and inspiration, and I wanted to share that. And I realized that you know, I, I could have also been, a, I thought about being a veterinarian, which I think is a great job. But you reach more people and inspire them to care about animals if, if you're right. So that's what I did. Excellent question. Thank you. Hello, my name is Bella, and I'm from Tuckahoe Middle. Sorry. At the beginning of Soul of an Octopus, you mentioned that octopus Octopuses are not known to show their beaks to people. Have you ever seen an octopus's beak? Oh, good question. Actually, I have two octopus beaks in our house. Um, I saw the tip 
of Octavia's beak. Um, and I may have s briefly seen the tip of Kali's beak. But the beak looks like a parrot's beak. It's black, but it's very light. The one I, I, I have one, actually, I have Athena's beak at, at our house. But I also have another octopus's beak. And it's, it's about this big. And you can't believe the thing is that strong and that light. But it's, it's, really, it's really cool. And it's the last thing you expect to see attached to an octopus. So wild. And I have a second question. Does figurative language help you describe the way octopuses move? Because you say like they move like liquid. Yes. Now you sound like a writer. <laughs> yeah, I am. Yeah. OK, great. Yeah, absolutely. You, 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 it's, hard, it's hard to describe without using language like that. Because they, the way they move is so different from anything anything else does. And in fact, how many people have seen Finding Dory, by the way? Has anyone seen? OK, awesome. It was awesome, wasn't it? And Hank was so true to Octopus. When they were doing, when they, when they were doing that animation, they really had to study how octopuses move, because nothing else moves like that. And they did an excellent, excellent job. But you have to reach out and use metaphor. and. Um, otherwise, it just, it just won't work. Thank you. Hi, I'm Salah Calendar from Hermitage High School. I was wondering, um, considering how smart and emotional octopuses are, is there ever a chance for them to be a service animal for people with depression and other mental illnesses? Oh, wow. What a great thought. Well, one reason this would be difficult is that you know they are saltwater animals and they don't live very long. So, um, but boy, I think service animals are one of the the best things ever invented to heal people. And uh, often, just having a tank of fish helps people. It drops your blood pressure like this. People just become so calm. But I would think that um, other animals that are easier to keep might be um, a, 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 better, a better choice. But I would love to see uh, people take advantage of their local aquariums and zoos to, to, to help them feel more, more calm, to, to help them with with the very issues that only animals seem to be able to reach in our souls. Thank you. Hi, I'm Faith. Um, so I wanted to be a marine biologist for a while. And I was wondering, since like octopi are, or octopuses, you said it was octopuses, are, um, they're so smart. So why did they live for such a short time? That is such a weird issue. Um, Peter Godfrey Smith, who is a diver philosopher who I mentioned in my book, and uh, he's got a new book out that you will want to read, and it's called Other Minds. And he talks about this. Some people are not utterly convinced. Um, longevity is often, as you know, associated with intelligence. We think of you know, humans that can live for 70, 80, 90 years. Elephants, uh, dolphins live a long time, et cetera, et cetera. And then you find this marine invertebrate model that their life is so short. And what is all this intelligence for? He says that the reason that they live such short lives um, is because someone is going to eat them. They better get their life over with, or at least one of the 100,000 that hatches has got to get its life over with and its eggs laid and everything it wants done in its life pretty fast. Because if you lived longer, someone would eat you. That's cool. But then you might ask, you know, what is their intelligence for, right? Because the reason that intelligence is associated with longevity in humans and in others is that you know, we're social species. So we use our intelligence to establish connections between other people. And most octopuses live fairly solitary lives. Well, Jennifer Mather, the uh, octopus psychologist in my book, points out that when the ancestors of octopuses lost their shell and they became an unprotected packet of delicious protein, 
they had to develop all kinds of intelligence to outwit all the prey that they wanted to eat and all the predators that wanted to eat them. So she says that is what drives their intelligence. <laughs>